we've had a lot of themes of change here, and I underwent a lot of change myself 13 years ago. In addition to being a plant ecologist working on tropical forests, I also write textbooks in the field of conservation biology. And 13 years ago, as I was working on the new edition of one of my textbooks, I was struck by the fact that all of the examples of climate change that I was including in my textbook were from faraway places, like polar bears in Alaska, or wildflowers in the Swiss Alps, or frogs in the mountains of Costa Rica. And there were no good examples of common species from anywhere in the eastern United States. And I thought this was very important to investigate because the American public was very skeptical of climate change. As I looked in the Boston area for thinking about trying to see if we could see some effects of climate change here in Massachusetts, I realized that Massachusetts was a great place to study, particularly the Boston area, because we've experienced about four degrees Fahrenheit warming over the last 150 years because of, not only because of global warming, but because of urbanization. And so that the Boston area would be a great model system for studying the effects of climate change. So I radically changed my research agenda 13 years ago and decided to investigate climate change. And it turns out if you're looking for climate change or the effects of climate change on the plants and the animals, you need to find old historical records. And the, there is no place better in the entire United States than the Boston area because of all the naturalists who've been working in the Boston area, including Henry David Thoreau. Several months into our investigation, we discovered that Thoreau had made very detailed records of observations. And this is one of his tables that he made up showing the flowering times of common plants in Concord during the um, 1850s. So on May 14th, um, 1855, plants like the highbush blueberry were flowering, and were starting to flower. And we've been repeating these same observations. So Thoreau's observations from the 1850s and our own observations for over the last 13 years. And what we found is that the plants in Concord, Massachusetts are now flowering about 10 days to two weeks earlier than they were in Thoreau's times. You also, in order to do this kind of research, you have to be good at reading Thoreau's handwriting, and he have, has notoriously <laughs> bad handwriting. Um, so this is the pattern for flowering time of plants and also leafing out. We've also found abundant records in Massachusetts of bird first arrival times. Um, also, some of these results are from just around here at Mount Arbon Cemetery. And what we find is that birds have a very different pattern than plants. So birds are arriving a few days earlier now than they were 160 years ago, but they are much less responsive than, to plants. They're only arriving a couple of days earlier. And we think that they're less responsive because they're not just responding to temperature like plants, but they are also responding to things like wind direction. They don't fly if there's a headwind. They don't fly if there's a uh, rain. And also, if they're in Florida or in Central America, they don't really know what the weather is like in the Boston area. So they're much less responsive than the plants. The missing link in the story is really what is happening with insects. We really had a great difficulty finding insect data in contrast to the abundance of bird data. And it really took us about eight years before we discovered any information about when birds were active in the spring. And then we discovered that there were data sets on butterflies and data sets on bees. And we found that, that these insects are also extremely responsive to temperature. They come out really early when it's a warm spring, and they come out really late when it's a cold spring. And so there's this potential for a mismatch between plants, animals, and, or plants, birds, and insects. So if the insects are coming out early and the plants are flowering, leafing out early, and the birds are not arriving in the same way in a warm year, when it's when, early in a warm year, then there's the potential that the birds could miss this great pulse of insects which appears in the spring, and they could not have enough food to eat, and they could wind up starving and not having enough food for their nestlings. So there's a lot of concern among ecologists of this potential for an ecological mismatch, and this is a very active area of research at the moment among ecologists. So one thing which is also different from our research approach from many other scientists is that we, very early from the beginning of our research, we not only wanted to do the best possible research, but we wanted to convey the interest very widely to the American public to teach them about the reality of climate change. So every time we write an article, we also write a popular article about it, we write a press release, we pitch the story to people, and this has been picked up in the press very widely. And then also starting around three years ago, I decided that rather than having journalists write about the kind of work we're doing at Boston University, that I would also try to write this version in a popular book. And so I've written this book, Walden Warming, 
climate change comes to Thoreau's Concord, and this will be available for sale in the reception area for all of you at a 20% discount. <laughs> It, it is a truly remarkable fact that we've been doing big ideas for busy people for, I think, at least four years, and this is the first time that anybody's actually managed to promote their new book. Uh, I can't believe it's taken that long. Anyway, Urgent, I think it's true, isn't it, that it's not just very famous figures like Thoreau who can be useful to your work, because you're, you've also done work where you've asked people to look through family archives, family photographs, uh, and trying to get data from people's own uh, family records about when particular uh, plants were coming into mm -hmm. bud or whatever. Is that work you're still doing? That's work that we're still very actively doing. So when we first started doing this, we found that there was this incredible wealth of information, uh, particularly in the metropolitan Boston area. So you have all these naturalist clubs like bird clubs and botanical clubs. There are all these museum specimens that you can compare with when plants were flowering in the past with when they are today. So many people keep journals of, of when they see plants flowering or birds, and also huge photograph collections. And you compare when plants were in flower or leafing out based on these photograph collections with when the present situation, with what the present situation is. Thank you. Please, a question here. Um, hello, thank you so much for doing this research. It's really good to focus on our local area to kind of help convey the message. And I was just wondering, out of you know, some of the facts you've mentioned here, what's sort of been the most poignant example that you think is most effective in conveying the effects of climate change to uh, you know, the community? Just because it's something we've known about for a while now, and it's not always getting much traction and actually sort of addressing. So just, right. yeah, I was wondering that. Well, I think that, I think that we were so fortunate that we found Thoreau's records. I think that that's what's really made our, our research so interesting is because we're connecting climate change to Thoreau and his research at Walden. Uh, but also, in addition, I mean, Thoreau's records, as far as we know, are the most detailed and oldest records of the timing of biological events in the United States. There are other records out there, but his ones are just so comprehensive for hundreds of plant species of both uh, leafing out, flowering time, and bird arrival times. Thank you. Please. I'm wondering if you've discussed perhaps with your colleagues on the MIT campus, what is up with all these rabbits in Cambridge? What's, okay, well, that's a very good question because I think can't that, we blame that, that on climate change? We can't, I think we can't blame it on climate change, but what we can blame that on is the fact that the, the system is constantly changing here. So in addition to climate change, there are a lot of other things happening in Concord. So we also have forest succession as the area recovers from farming. We have invasive species. So there's a lot of change. And within my lifetime, I've seen so many changes in the animal communities as different animal species have come into this area from further west. Thank you. Please. Right along those lines, um, it seems like uh, robins don't migrate anymore. We had such a cold winter, but there were robins everywhere, and robins are known for arriving in the springtime. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, that's right. One thing which has changed a lot since Thoreau made his observations is he recorded the arrival time of species like robins um, and sparrows, and a lot of these species are non-migratory anymore. So in our research, we're only really focusing on the migratory species. We can't use robins. But robins are around in the wintertime more because the ground is often bare because of lack of snow cover. Also, the robins are eating a lot of the invasive species, the fruits of invasive plant species. And that gives them a winter food source that they never had before because of all the honeysuckles and privets and other species like that. Isn't that a problem for robins? I mean, we just had one of the snowiest winters for a while, at least where I was. And um, if robins have, as it were, decided not to, not to migrate and they're stuck here, that sounds like a bad time. Well, that's right. So when we have these very cold, well, we think of this as a very cold winter. This actually wasn't a cold winter. It was actually just an average winter by historical standards, but we're comparing it to the last 15 years, which have been extremely warm. But when we do have a warm winter, a very cold winter like this, robins don't do as well. A lot of uh, insects, a lot of the invasive insects or invasive plants don't do as well in, in years like this. Okay, thank you. Please. I know there's been some very similar work done with old records uh, back home in the UK. What, what's your knowledge of um, international efforts to look at old records to uh, observe climate change? People doing change? this in other parts of the world. That's right. So people are, people are doing this in other parts of the world. So particularly the United Kingdom has made a huge effort in terms of assembling all these records. Um, in Germany, there's a lot of attempts to do this. And I was on sabbatical in Japan. And when I told my host that I was going to look for old records to analyze the effects of climate change, he said, oh, we don't have those kinds of records here. 
And then as we searched over the next couple of weeks, we just found, or next couple of months, we just found there were enormous amounts of these, this kind of information in Japan as well, in Korea, and many other countries. And people are starting to bring it together. There's an organization in the United States called the National Phenology Network that actually has specifically sought out these kinds of records and is assembling them. Thank you. So uh, you'll be able to ask more questions of Richard and look at his book at the reception, which will take place immediately after this event next door. Thank you.